Well, there once was a country and I left it as a child with my memory of the sunlight clear. And the worst news of it cannot break my view of that bright filled paperweight. And it may be sick and it may be at war, but I am granted by sunlight. And I have no passport and there's no way back, but my city comes to me and takes me dancing. Cracking conversation, analytical interpretation, and igniting imagination with the Lit and Lang Gang. Hello everybody, welcome back to the Lit and Lang Gang. And I'm afraid since we are in lockdown, you find me alone, this is Miss Graham. Though that introduction was beautifully put together for you by Mr Grimmett. Um, which is really interesting because I literally gave him about five minutes and I sent him a message saying, do you want to do a lovely introduction to the podcast? And he came back with that, so that's really quite impressive. Today we're going to be talking through Carol Ruman's poem, The Emigre. In my opinion, it's probably one of the harder ones in the anthology, so it probably takes a little bit more revising. Um, but again, as always, I hope you find this useful. Okay, so as always, I'm going to start by talking you through the context of The Emigre. So um, this is one of those ones I think it's a little bit more challenging because there's not a huge amount of Carol Ruman's life that we can put into the emigre, unlike with poems like Extract from the Prelude or Remains, where obviously there's loads to learn about Simon Armitage and his work, or Wordsworth and his life, in order for that one to make sense. Here, we've just got a little bit to look at. Um, Carol Ruman herself was born in South London, so she's not um, an emigrant per se. Um, she's grown up there. But she's published a number of poems, um, Russian poems, and then translated them into English, which according to, I'm taking this off Wikipedia and it's something I've written on my poem, if you're having a look on the VLE and you've downloaded my annotated copy of the poems, you'll see it's on there. According to the critic Ben Wilkinson, um, this shows that Carol Rumors has a fascination with elsewhere. So she's got a real interest in the world and society and places beyond her own. So perhaps puts a little bit of context onto the emigre there, which is, you know, dealing with a land and a city where the speaker is elsewhere in the world other than the place that she actually wants to be in. The only other bit of context I've really mentioned is, is kind of linked in with language. So it's kind of a nice little hinge as we go into the language section of the poem, um, in a sense that emigre is a French word, it's a feminine word for an emigrant. And if we look at what an emigrant is, that's someone that's left somewhere. So probably in society we're more used to hearing the term immigrant spelt with an I, and that's when someone moves into a place. A migrant is someone that moves around a place, so for example moving around within England, but an emigrant would be someone that's left. And therefore, when we take in that title into context, French um, French language, female, so we've definitely got that idea of femininity, and I think that's quite obvious in the poem itself, um, and someone that has left somewhere, um, and of course that then brings it into that, that clear context for us about what that's about, even from the title. Um, in the 1990s, there was a, a huge increase in the number of immigrants entering various countries across the world, there was um, rife conflict, and therefore populations were varying in size across the country across the country, across the world. So we can see that title then, lastly, just come into a little bit more context. Okay, so the language of emigre. Um, I want to start with an idea that's actually prevalent throughout, and, and it comes up as a motif four times in the poem, and that's the motif of sunlight. Now, we can call it repetition, we can call it a motif. The choice is actually yours, to be honest with this one, because repetition is when the same word or phrase is used more than once. But a motif is an idea that a text continually comes back to. And you might argue it's more of a structural technique than a language technique. But if you look on line two of the emigre, but my memory of it is sunlight clear. So we've got this idea there on the second line. If you look at the eighth line, which is the final line of the first stanza, it says, but I'm branded by an impression of sunlight. So we have it there again. If you look at the end of the second stanza, line 16, it tastes of sunlight. And then the final line of the poem, line 30, falls as evidence of sunlight. So you can see that motif appear four times. Now when we take the connotation of a word like sunlight into consideration, it's positive, it's warming, it's comforting, it's, pos as I say, positive again. So all of that combined, 
this poem is interspersed with ideas of happiness and when you think about what this poem is really about it's it's about from from the from the uh, character's perspective it's a poem about her leaving somewhere that she loves leaving her home and coming to somewhere else but looking back and loving where she came from but when we take an objective view of the poem really it's, it's a poem of a refugee someone that's left somewhere that is torn apart by war and she's remembering it as it once was and maybe even that in itself is a little bit flimsy as a memory but her memory of it is continually positive so sunlight 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 happy positive even if we really question if that's true or not because I don't want to cusp on the themes which I'll come to at the end but one of the key themes of this poem is memory and how how accurate is her memory versus what really happened and this this memory of sunlight for her is integral it's really very very important so that's the first thing I think about that repetition the connotations of sunlight being very positive and I say that that lasting motif the next thing I want to come on to here is on line where am I line six is a really poignant metaphor um my original view the bright filled paperweight and I think that's a really lovely idea because here is where the poet starts to suggest that maybe the city she remembers isn't the reality of what it was like so the full line starts on line five the worst news I receive of it cannot break my original view the bright filled paperweight now when we isolate the word she's selecting there bright filled these are again quite positive quite happy um yet there's a little bit of negativity in here the the worst news I receive cannot break my original view break like this is quite fragile this memory in itself if pushed if have pressure on it would fall apart because it's not real but of course the main bit is that metaphor of it being a paperweight she's weighed down by this this is heavy this is all consuming this is maybe even perhaps difficult to carry around with her that maybe it's a lie maybe she knows it's a lie we don't know it's it, that is very much left open to interpretation however there's something quite negative so i think lines five and six together we've got the positivity she's deliberately putting in but maybe there's that subtlety of the break and the paperweight that she doesn't realize she's telling us that actually this memory has a huge amount of negativity for her and i really like a couple of ideas that have preceded this one so it says there once was a country and then there's the ellipses now the ellipses itself is structural but there once was a country that's really vague it could be anywhere in the world that she's talking about but she deliberately doesn't tell us it's followed by the fact of i left it as a child um which instantly gives us that idea of okay you're a child so how much do you really remember you know if you think about your childhood memories guys and, and think about what you remember from that and how realistic is it because you're a child what do you really remember so it kind of instantly sets her up as maybe a little bit of an uh, unreliable narrator and that's not necessarily to her detriment that's not because she's a bad person trying to present it in a way it's just because she's so innocent and naive when she left she didn't really realize what was going on um when she goes on to line three for it seems i never saw it in that november i, I thought I ne- it's, it's quite a few things here i never saw it in that november next line which i am told so all of this comes from like a third hand perspective she never saw it in november it's this idea it's been told to her even that which i'm told is isolated by commas this isn't her memory it's someone else's is she even certain of the truth here what really happened in that moment and then we go into lines i'm skipping over now that metaphor i mentioned earlier sorry i'm doing this in a funny kind of way line seven and eight there's a bit of personification but what this line really starts to set up for and a metaphor as well but what this really starts to set up is a semantic field of war. And if you have a little look, it may be at war. Well, there's your first one. It may be sick with tyrants, but I'm branded by an impression of sunlight. So three words there, war, tyrant, branded, that all give the idea of war, pain, suffering. And as we go through, I'll mention this semantic field now and I won't come back to it again. Line 10, rolls its tanks and the frontiers on line 11 there. So we've actually got okay now we've got a few words associated with war she's not said war well she has actually no that's a lie it may be a war even that in itself you know is uncertain but then the rest of her lexis the language that she's choosing tells us that this place is dangerous and it definitely has that warlike image let's go back to line seven 
it may be sick with tyrants. And I love the personification there that something she loves, it's not its fault, it's sick, it's poorly, it needs tending to because it's caught this tyrant, it's caught this villainy, it's caught this dreadful disease that's making it ill, as though it's not the city's fault. And so she's protecting it very much. And that branded by the impression of sunlight, well, branded is a metaphor. Branded is what you do to cattle guys. Nowadays, you know, it's a lot less brutal. They kind of spray paint cattle to kind of show who owns it. But once upon a time, branding would be, and in some parts of the world it still is, to literally burn your initials and your mark into your cattle to show that they were yours. So I'm branded by an impression of sunlight. So something painful, something forceful, something really quite nasty associated with her homeland. As we go into the second stanza, she tries to kind of almost iron this out again. The white streets of that city, the graceful slopes, again, two positive words, very much that she selected because she's showing her view of it. For her, the city is wonderful, the city is incredible, the city is a place that she loves, so it's white, it's graceful. But a glow, even clearer again, glow, as time rolls its tanks and the frontiers rise between us, close like waves. So the idea that it's us, inclusive pronouns, she's showing intimacy with the country, she's got a close bond with it, but that military language again, showing that this isn't exactly what she remembers it to be. I really love the simile on line, what are we up to, line 12, 13, that child's vocabulary I carried here like a hollow doll opens and spills a grammar. This is way more about her now, that vocabulary that she's held inside her. She's a hollow doll, she's empty, she's a shell without her city. It just reminds us again, her child's vocabulary. Again, that reminder of how innocent she was um, when she came here, how little she really knows. And, and again, though, I like that I carried here like a hollow doll. That simile. Or maybe she's empty because she's away from her culture, her heritage. She isn't at home, so she's empty there. Um, and the way that, you know, she goes through and she talks about her language. Um, it may now be a lie, banned by the state, but I can't get it off my tongue. And this idea that the language now that she holds in her mouth, because of course that's where we create language, is tainted. Maybe it's, it's you know, banned by the state, it's banned by the government. She's not allowed to speak that language. She's constrained so much by it um but she desperately wants to hold on to it she keeps it on her she can't get it off her tongue and again it tastes of sunlight that repetitive idea is very positive for her so everyone else views her language as negative but of course her memory of it is incredibly positive in the way that it tastes on her tongue and feels of her tongue um and i think as well there's a little bit of synesthesia here she's talking about language something that you hear but she talks about the taste of it on her tongue so that's very overwhelming like she's holding it in because she's not allowed to speak it, and I think that's really important. And as we move into the final stanza, this one's very much all about constraint and being pinned down. I have no passport, there's no way back at all. And I think even that first line is, there's no language technique in that, that's just very blunt and very harrowing for someone that clearly has such positive memories, there's no way back, she can't get back to this country now. And then she has this beautiful metaphor, this is my personal favourite lines of the poem, but my city comes to me in its own white plain. It lays down in front of me, docile as paper. I comb its hair and love its shining eyes. Now, if we were in any way uncertain about how she feels about her city, then that is telling us exactly how she feels. That almost, you could look at this a couple of ways. We've got the positivity of the white plain. So again, innocence, purity, um, that she sees that. That's how she sees her city. And, it, and also the way the city finds its way back to her, even though she can't get to it. It lies in front of me, docile as paper, so gentle, docile, but then we've also got that like as paper, so light, airy, white again. I comb its hair and love its shining eyes, that personification of it. I mean, we can read that one of two ways, like a lover, like she's combing its hair and loving it, or like a child, like she's protecting it. Note the way that she's combing its hair, she's improving its appearance, making it look better than it is, which, let's face it, that's what she's doing throughout the poem. She's making the city sound better than it really is. But at the same time, the way she's loving its shining eyes, it makes her sound emotionally dependent on that city, like she needs it in some way, and it needs her. So the pair of them are like fighting this battle together. Her memory of the city and what it once was, and her need of it, they are dependent on one another. Then we have this idea of loving. My city takes me dancing through the city of walls, but there we notice that little bit of negativity. My city takes me dancing, well, yeah, very romantic and beautiful, but through the city of walls like it's now tucked in and constrained and can't move. 
the end of the poem, the language here is really quite sinister. They accuse me of absence, they circle me, they accuse me of being dark in their free city. They, 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 look at the repetition of they, like this is a, an accusatory part now. Who are they, um, the native people that are left in her city that she, has she no longer is part of? Um, but they're accusing her, this guilt that she's abandoned it. Um, really showing us that she has idealised it there. They accuse me of being dark in their free city. So this idea that she is in contrast to her memory, that she herself is dark. But notice the way this is all against her. My city hides behind me. Look at the personification of that vulnerability. She is protecting it at every cause. They mutter death and my shadow falls, evidence, falls as evidence of sunlight. So again, her shadow, remember she's creating that light imagery, but actually there's darkness in all of this. Even though there's light, her shadow... I mean, her shadow shows the positivity. She's creating the positivity. She's, she is the evidence of sunlight. She's the last living positivity of this city, perhaps. Or maybe that's the way she views it. But equally, it's definitely got that dark undertone here. If you just look at the Lexus twist at the end, circle, dark, hides, death, shadow. So all of that combined, you can see that's really dark there at the end. But notice the way we return to that repetition, that motif of sunlight, she will always return to hope. She will always return to positivity where she can. I'm going to talk through the structure now. So um, again, I, I actually don't have a huge amount of structure here to mention for you. It's in three stanzas. Um, we have two stanzas of eight lines and one stanza of nine lines. I always like to read into that, like it's quite a structured poem in a sense, eight, eight and nine. And I like to, it's almost like she can't let go, like she's holding on and she holds on for that final line. And we've got the irregular rhythm. So it's not in a like um, set didum didum didum. It's it's irregular. It's very conversational, almost like her spilling her vocabulary that she mentions, um, and that as I say really represents the speaker. You know, she opens and spills a grammar, and so the poem has no real structure. Um, and maybe it's just that the speaker's uneasy or unsettled. She's unhappy where she is. She wants to go back to where she feels she comes from. So the poem in itself is a little bit unsettled. Um, we've got continual use of enjambement, again, just kind of mirroring that idea of this being very conversational, very overflowing. Remember, I'll come on to themes in a moment, but this this poet, this, well, not poet, because this isn't her story, but the character here is really emotional talking about this, especially towards the end. So the enjambement is there, even though subtle every now and then, just to show this overflowing, but then she pu pulls it back, probably because she's had to so many times. Um, and more than that, I don't think there's a huge amount here for structure. Um, again, you could mention that sunlight, 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 sunlight as um, a motif, and that gives you a little bit of structure as well. Um, but other than that, it tries to stay in structure. It is unsuccessful in doing so, and I like the idea of the nine lines at the end, like she's desperately trying to hold on to something. Okay, so last thing I want to talk about then are the themes of this poem. So the key one, I think, is going to be a conflict of memory, perhaps, um, or just memory in itself because power of memory, conflict of memory I think you can have either because think about it, her memory is different from the reality, she's clearly a refugee she's clearly had to leave this place as a child because it's overthrown by war but that's not what she remembers, she remembers white she remembers sunlight, she remembers graceful so all of these things, her memory is not very realistic of the reality of it for that reason I think oh, this poem goes really well, I mean I know I've seen people talk about this one with tissue um Though I think, personally, I wouldn't be very confident looking at that one with tissue. For me, I think this goes really well with my last duchess and the way that a memory's been manipulated. Um, because if you look at the way that he's presenting the duchess, who, depending on your interpretation, we never truly find out. But in my opinion, I think the duchess has got to be innocent. It's just his view of her and the story he tells is different from the reality. And this is the same here. So I think for memory, personally, I would pick my last duchess there. We also have conflict of place, which I think is quite interesting. So the place itself is a conflict. It goes beautifully for that reason with London. So you can see that London is a place that um, Blake talks about as being a conflict. You know, we have the chartered, uh, the chartered streets, the chartered Thames. Um, we have the blood down palace walls, this place of the, the, the people versus the place, and that's all a conflict. And I think that goes really well with the emigre. And then just something like emotional conflict. So a woman that feels... In, or internal conflict, you could call it. So, conflicted with what she remembers versus the reality of it and all of that. In which case, that can go with numerous poems. Um, internal conflict remains is quite nice, but I actually think for that one, also checking out my history is quite nice. You know, 
that he's an internal conflict versus what he's been taught versus what he knows to be important and for the emigre what she remembers versus what is the reality so i think for that reason it goes really well with that one too i hope you found this useful guys it's just a short one i'm really sorry that we don't have the group together to kind of talk this through which is honestly the best way to do the podcast but of course in current situations we can't do it that way um if you have any questions of course um do feel free to email your teachers we are contactable in this time um and i hope you're finding these useful um and you're able to learn from them and as always just as that reminder if you go onto the key stage four area of the vle and you go through and you find the little nan gang section you'll find an annotated anthology of all the poems so that you can have a look through because there's other things in here i haven't mentioned i don't really have time i've just gone through some key ideas but you might find that quite useful as well hope you're all well and i'll speak to you soon bye guys